As was discussed in the last full episode, episode 2, the first enslaved Africans were brought to America in 1619 through the brutal and heinous conditions of the Middle Passage. By the 1700s, there were more than 7 million enslaved individuals in the American colonies. During the Revolutionary War, both sides used enslaved blacks as pawns for victory. The English first offered to free any black person who would fight on their side, pushing the American Congress to reverse their exclusive policy and promise to free blacks who fought for them. Enslaved blacks served on both sides of the war in such battles as Lexington and Concord, Bunker Hill, and Fort Ticonderoga. By the war's end, around 5,000 black people fought for the freedom of a nation that refused to free them. When the 1788 Constitutional Convention rolled around, 25 of the 55 delegates owned slaves, with many others having previously owned slaves at different points in their lives. During the convention, slavery was enshrined in the Constitution with the Three-Fifths Compromise, a compromise between Northerners and Southerners in regards to congressional representation. Southerners wanted slaves to be counted as population for representation in the House of Representatives so they could have an outsized voice in Congress. The delegates agreed to count enslaved individuals as three-fifths of a person. The convention also gave power to Congress to ban the slave trade, but not until 1808. In 1808, Congress did act to ban the foreign slave trade, though this prompted the national slave trade to flourish. Due to this and the invention of the cotton gin, slavery expanded and the United States became a slave society, with a culture and economy heavily relying on the oppression and labor of black people. At the time of the convention, Many, including slaveholders, believed that as America matured and civilized, slavery would fade. Though due to the merge of slavery into the fabric of American culture and government, that never occurred. In 1818, Missouri applied to become the first state west of the Mississippi River, agitating the divide between slaveholders and free states. Slaveholders argued that Missouri should choose whether or not it be slave or free, as they knew the new state would likely choose slave. Free states feared that adding a slave state to the country would threaten the balance between northern and southern interests in Congress and lead to more tensions down the road. As debates raged on, in 1819 it was clear neither side would be victorious and a compromise was needed. Speaker of the House Henry Clay proposed that Missouri be admitted as a slave state and Maine be admitted as a free state in order to balance the slave versus free divide. Northerners and Southerners found this to ease their concerns, though the issue of slavery's future held space in their minds. Was Congress to debate and be forced to compromise for every state the expanding nation added, or could a compromise be made to solve this divide? In order to address these questions, Congress added a second part to the compromise, prohibiting slavery north of an imaginary 3630 parallel line, making what legislators hoped to be an equation for settling this debate. Referring to the questions presented by Missouri and the established compromise, former President Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter, quote, This momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once the knell of the Union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence." End quote. More than a decade after the Missouri Compromise, the nation was met with a crisis that, while not directly linked with slavery, would establish a flashpoint event leading to the Civil War. Besides slavery, some of the greatest debates between the North and the South revolved around American fiscal policy and tariffs. In 1828, Congress passed the Tariff of 1828 that raised tariffs on imported goods in order to decrease European competition against northern manufactured products. The South termed this as the Tariff of Abominations, as tariffs against European states that use southern resources like cotton to produce their goods would cause them to reciprocate with high tariffs, which would mostly hurt the southern economy that relied heavily on exporting raw materials to Europe. 
In 1832, South Carolina, being fed up with the tariff, attempted to nullify the law by passing an ordinance to not collect the taxes prescribed by the federal government. South Carolina native and Vice President John C. Calhoun believed that since states entered and formed the Union, they had the right to overrule a federal law if they deemed it unconstitutional. President Andrew Jackson, a Southerner and slaveholder, vehemently opposed South Carolina's actions. Jackson managed to get Congress to lower the tariff enough to appease South Carolina, but also to pass the Force Act, a law that allowed the federal government to use force against a state if they attempted to nullify a tariff. The nullification crisis is an important event when looking at the lead-up to the Civil War, because this was one of the first times a state unsuccessfully considered and hinted at secession. As we continue further into Henry Wilson's life and the Civil War, these events will continue to be of importance. Thanks for listening. I look forward to continuing through the life of Henry Wilson. Mm-hmm.